you so much. Uh, so it's, it's always an honor to be here. Um, your, your conferences are always great, and I, I learn a ton, so hopefully I can you know, repay the favor a little. I was asked to talk about uh, shoulder instability and, and kind of give uh, the United States perspective, because it's a little different than, than what I've seen here and in, in Europe. Um, so my topic is the uh, ladder J procedure in the, U in the United States and, and why we don't use it all the time. It means of background, I'm from Hospital for Special Surgery, which is in uh, New York City on the Upper East Side. It's uh, you know, solely an orthopedic hospital, uh, very similar kind of in, in format to Aspitar uh, in the sense that it's kind of orthopedics and, and sports medicine. Um, we, we do joint replacements, spine surgery, you know, so it's a little more uh, varied, but it's, it's really an orthopedic-focused hospital with 130 orthopedic surgeons on staff, uh, 70, over 100 trainees, so fellows and residents, and we do more than 35,000 surgeries a year there, so it's a lot. Um, it's for years now, I think eight or nine years in a row, been the number one ranked uh, orthopedic hospital in, in the United States and the number one ranked orthopedic residency for longer than that. With regards to sports medicine, very similar to here, you know, it's, uh, sports is a big focus, and we take care of you know most of the teams in the New York area, uh, and then a lot of the United States teams, rowing, swimming, uh, tennis, things of that nature. Personally, I'm the doctor for the Rangers, which is the hockey team, uh, and the Mets, which is the baseball team, and I think that's that sort of color is my perspective on instability because dealing with two completely different groups of athletes. Um, it kind of helps you realize that, you know, it's, it's not one size fits all when treating these problems and, and different requirements are going to lead you to potentially indicate different procedures. I've now been to Doha, you know, probably 10 or 15 times. So a lot of similarities between New York when, especially when people ask back in, you know, back in America, how is it? Um, and now I, I said yesterday, I had lunch at Katsuya and dinner at Cut, which are two of my favorite restaurants in LA. And I was doing that here. So not much of a difference with regards to that. One glaring difference, every time I walk by the Shake Shack here in, in the uh, Villaggio, it's empty, which contrasts completely with, with New York, where there's always a line around the block. So um, either we've been convinced that it's a, a good burger place, or you guys haven't found that out yet. But uh, overall, a lot of similarities. So again, thank you for having me, and it's great to be back. I'm going to talk again about shoulder instability, and I've, I've left time for questions purposely, so feel free to you know, ask at the end or, or interrupt. Um, so a, a lot of this will be review for you to start, but we know that the glenohumeral joint is the most mobile articulation in the body with, with uh, you know, a lot of range of motion, which also you know, may explain why it's the most commonly dislocated major joint. It's not a hip where it's a real constrained joint. It's, it's much less constrained. And when I talk to patients, I often use the golf ball on a golf tee analogy, or even you know, to make the point even more clear, I'll say like a golf ball on a saucer. Um, there's a lot, there's not much constraint, which is going to allow greater range of motion, particularly for sports like baseball and throwing. Unfortunately, that's, there's a trade-off. That's going to lead to less stability. So when you talk about shoulder instability, that's unfortunately not uncommon, about almost a 2% prevalence in the general population. But when you start talking about athletes, it can you know, approach 10%. Typically, it's going to affect patients between 50 and 15 and 40 years old. Um, again, that's the group that's going to be more athletic and, and at a higher risk for this. Several studies have looked at the, uh, the risk of recurrent instability after a dislocation and sort of broken it down by age, because that's also going to affect how you treat these patients. Um, you know, if they're, they're over 40, then you can often get away with treating them conservatively, even, you know, 20s and 30s if they're not as active. But when you start looking at the numbers here, you know, 15-year-old, 16-year-old on the, I don't have a pointer, I apologize, but um, almost a 90% recurrence rate if it happens to a 15 or 16-year-old. So that's really going to kind of affect the conversations you have with the, with the patient or, or parents um, at that age. The typical pathology, uh, the Bankart lesion, is, is an avulsion of the anterior inferior glenoid, um, a labrum, uh, by the IGHL, uh, and that, that's the overwhelming sort of you know, pathology that we encounter when people dislocate their shoulder. The hill Sachs lesion, and that's going to be a little bit of a focus of this talk, um, is found in about 80% of unstable shoulders, and it's, it's basically a compression fracture of the posterior lateral humeral head described by two doctors, Hill and Sachs, uh, and it can engage the, the anterior glenoid. And as I'll point out, you know, sort of classically, especially when I first started in practice, you'd mention that as sort of something in passing, like, oh, that's just a sign that the shoulder dislocated. It's, it's not a big deal, and we, we typically ignore it. But I think that's really, we've gained an appreciation for that as shoulder surgeons, and now that really factors into our treatment algorithm. 
Prior to imaging studies, though, obviously, you know, when you're treating these patients and athletes, a history is critical. How did it occur? Are they, what, you know, what sports are they playing? Are they contact athletes? Um, was it put back in? A lot of times, you know, I'll see patients in the office who, who sort of describe instability, um, but they've never had a, a frank dislocation, and sometimes it's, you know, a biceps that can be causing some of this clicking or, or their sensation of instability. But if they have to go back to the ER, put it back in place, that's clearly, you know, a frank dislocation. How many times has this happened? Um, what are the goals of the patient? How old were they with their, at the time of their first dislocation? Because as I mentioned a few slides ago, if this is happening multiple times before the age of 20, we know how this is going to play out, and it's going to keep happening unless the shoulder is stabilized. On exam, you're also going to want to look for things like generalized laxity. Uh, are they unstable at mid ranges of motion? You know, that's going to lead me to think that they're a little more unstable and probably more significant pathology. Uh, and imaging studies play a critical role. X-rays looking at, you know, for Hill Sachs lesions, as I just described, bony bank heart lesions, is the shoulder reduced? MRI, you know, we, um, that's, that's, you know, we almost always get one uh, in the United States. Uh, but particularly if it, the patient's over the age of 40, there's almost a 50% association with concomitant rotator cuff pathology, which you don't want to miss. Uh, but if you're concerned about bone loss or particularly in revision stabilization cases where they've had a stabilization already, arthroscopically maybe, a CT scan uh, becomes kind of one of my go-tos to really get a good appreciation for bone loss. So once you get to the point where you say, okay, you know what, they, they need a stabilization, um, You know, our main, our gold standard in the United States is an arthroscopic, and, and this is, again, the, the title of the talk is why, you know, why don't we use a ladder every time. Our gold standard is an arthroscopic labor repair. So um, it's, it's technically pretty easy. Um, patients are familiar with arthroscopic surgeries, and, and it's been done for years. So, you know, it, it seems like a, a big jump if you tell them that we're going to take a piece of their bone, which I'll describe, and, and fix it with two screws. Uh, but this is what we do arthroscopically. I'm looking from the back of the shoulder to the front. The, uh, that's a, a shaver there that I'm sort of cleaning up the, the neck of the glenoid because it's not talked about a lot, but you want the labrum to heal. You know, we talk about healing when you talk about rotator cuff repairs, but the, uh, the labrum clearly has to heal as well. So here we've mobilized that, that capsular labral complex. And I'm now going to, you can see I'm actually sort of pulling up towards the top of the screen. That's a superior... You want to repair the labrum, but you also want to shift it up and sort of tighten up the capsule. So um, it's, it's a shift as well as kind of a repair of the labrum. You want to decrease that capsular volume. I'm passing a suture here. And one of the big sort of advances just implant-wise are knotless anchors, um, which I'm going to use here. So I'm shuttling a suture in what we call a mattress fashion. I've got, you know, this is good tissue, good tissue quality. It's holding the sutures well. I can really shift that, you know, bring up that whole inferior glenohumeral ligament complex. I'm now drilling it, and now I'll put the anchor in, and you're going to see that's really going to reduce the labrum and capsule back to the glenoid well. And it's, you know, this is, this video probably, unfortunately for you guys, has not been sped up, so it's boring to watch, but, um, you know, it's pretty quick to do in real life. You know, it takes a minute or two to put in each of these anchors, so, uh, and then I won't bore you with the details, but I would do the same thing, repeating it, the steps kind of moving superiorly relative to the face of the glenoid there for a knotless bank cart repair. And, you know, it's quick, it's easy, it's low morbidity, um, and, and the results are pretty good. But we do want to look at the results critically. So, you know, going back to the first days of arthroscopic um, stabilizations, transglenoid sutures uh, and staples, uh, the results were not great. You know, almost a 30% failure rate or, or revision, need for revision stabilization. We've definitely gotten better using techniques that I just showed, and you know now we've probably reduced that to eight or nine percent. That said, clearly, you know, now it's never going to be one hundred percent. We I, I tell patients all the time when I treat them in the office that when we fix you, we're not making you into Wolverine. You're not going to be indestructible, um, but clearly, we want better than eight or nine percent. So let's look at the reasons why arthroscopic surgery has failed sometimes. Well, bone defects I mentioned. You know, if they've got a big bone lesion on the glenoid here, we know that that's going to predispose patients to, uh, to failing an arthroscopic procedure. I mentioned the Hill-Sachs lesion earlier and, and said that we previously just sort of talked about this in passing, that, that it's almost, almost like an ACL when you see a bone bruise in the tibia, that it's a sign that something else happened. But now, 
we've really gained an appreciation for the Hill Sachs lesion. We realize that you know that's going to affect um, the, the the range of motion that that the shoulder can tolerate. Some patients have just sort of an anatomic deformity, an inverted pear glenoid. It's called where you know theoret typically. The bottom of the glenoid is wider, and that's going to allow it to be more stable. Uh, but if you have an inverted pear-shaped glenoid, uh, you can see that the bottom of the glenoid there is much, there's a lot less sort of surface area for the humeral head to engage on, and that's going to predispose somebody uh, to, to re-dislocate. So this was a study by Steve Burkhart and uh, Joe DeBeer, who's in South Africa, and Steve Burkhart's in Texas. And they looked at 200 patients who didn't have any bone loss that they treated arthroscopically. And they only had a 4% recurrence rate, which is, again, that's, that's pretty good. That's probably getting to as close as we can get because it's never going to be perfect considering that these are patients who are going to go back to playing sports and high-demand sports in many cases. Unfortunately, when they looked at 21 patients with significant bone loss, and we'll, we'll talk about how that definition of significant bone loss has changed, but when they looked at 21 patients with significant bone loss, there was almost a 70% recurrence rate. So that is clearly not acceptable. For that group, moving forward, they started to use the ladder J procedure. And that, you know, again, they defined bone loss as more than 25%. They looked at their next 100 patients, and they reduced the recurrence rate to 4.7%, so very much in line with their arthroscopic results with no bone loss. So, um, and that's been borne out in other studies as well. If we looked at studies by John Tokish or, or Pascal Bolo, overall, you know, pretty low f recurrence rates with arthroscopic techniques but if there was a bony defect there, particularly significant bony defects, more than 20, 25%, you know, almost 90% recurrence rates, 70% as I showed with the Burkhardt series, 75% with Bolo. So bone loss is really a factor here, and it has to be addressed, and, and you know, it's going to factor into how we treat these patients. So are there other risk factors for failure of arthroscopic bank hearts? Yes, contact athletes. Um, you know, a much higher failure rate if you're playing rugby, playing American football, uh, using an arthroscopic procedure. Males more than females do have a higher risk of recurrence. If they're younger, uh, they're going to have a higher risk of recurrence. Now, these are not contraindications to do arthroscopic procedures, but all of these have to factor into your decision-making process. Uh, and then glenoid and humeral bone loss, which we'll focus on more specifically. So again, if, you know, if the latter J works in the worst case scenarios, meaning that was significant bone loss, well, then why not do it in everybody? Um, and that's really the question that, that I'm going to answer. But we'll take a step back first. How does the Latterge procedure work? Well, it was described by uh, Miguel Latterge, who was a French surgeon. And he described the triple effect. So there's the bone block effect. And I, I, you know, I don't want to speak down to you guys. You have a good understanding of this. But the way I explain it to patients is that, you know, to use that golf ball and golf tee analogy – you're basically making the golf tee bigger. So there's more space there. There's more surface area for the ball to, con to sit on. It's going to make the shoulder more stable. So you're taking a tip of the coracoid, cutting it off, and then transferring it to the anterior aspect of the glenoid to increase the surface area. But that's not all it does. It really works two other ways. And, and as I'll show what we looked at in the lab, you know, the main way that it works is by moving the coracoid in between the subscapularis there. This is the subscapularis in the front of the shoulder. It's, we put it through a split in the subscapularis. When you bring the arm into an abduction external rotation position, a throwing position, or that at-risk position for anterior instability, what it's doing is really lowering the inferior half of the subscap via the sling effect. So it's reinforcing that anterior-inferior capsule, and that's probably the main way that this works. And then the third effect is the bumper effect, where you're basically reinforcing the capsule uh, with the CA ligament. So you, you take the native capsule, and reinforce it with the CA ligament. This, quite frankly, ha, you know, is probably the least important of the three, particularly because a lot of the time when you're doing, uh, especially for me, when I'm doing a ladder J, as I mentioned, it's not my main sort of go-to for instability. A lot of times it's done in revision cases. The patients don't have great tissue. One of the issues or one of the reasons why I'm doing it is because they don't have good capsular tissue. So you're not even able to repair the CA ligament or reestablish this bumper effect. So that, that works in some cases, but the main effects here are the bone block effect and the sling effect. We looked at a cadaveric model, trying to figure out, you know, kind of of these three, you know, how does it work? Um, and, and we found that, you know, we, we did this with a, by loading the conjoint tendon um, and, and not loading it. And really, the conjoint tendon is really what played the main role in, in establishing stability uh, when doing the latter J. Uh, with, with the 
so sort of full disclosure being this was not a bone loss model. So this was kind of a normal glenoid. We, we did a ladder J procedure to see what was going to have the most effect, and it was really the conjoint tendon. The results, Jill Walsh is, you know, really, again, it was described by, by Dr. Latterjay, who was from Lyon, France, which is where Jill Walsh practices, uh, and he's really become kind of the, the father of this uh, for this next generation. He does, you know, kind of more of these than anybody, and he's had great results. You know, a recurrence rate of almost 2% uh, in more than 2,500 Latterjays. Full disclosure, you know, he's, he gave uh, grand rounds at Hospital for Special Surgery last year, and by his own admission, there, are, you know, while he uses it, the overwhelming majority of the time, and his results have been very good. Um, there are cases for him where, where he doesn't even use a ladder J anymore because of, you know, concerns. So seizure disorders, uh, multi-directional instability. So even for Jill Walsh, kind of the, you know, the, the father of the, the modern ladder J, it's not a use it every time type procedure. Now, another study from, uh, from Europe, this is uh, Professor uh, Christian Gerber. He looked at the long-term restoration of anterior shoulder instability, it was a retrospective study comparing arthroscopic bank heart versus an open ladder J procedure. Uh, almost 100 ladder J's and almost 300 bank hearts. Now, they only did the bank hearts if there was less than 10% glenoid bone loss. But what I want to point here, and, and again, I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes, the it didn't consider humeral head bone loss. So to look at bone loss in isolation on the glenoid side might be one of the issues uh, why we were seeing higher failure rates with arthroscopic procedures. That said, in his study, uh, you know, a, almost a, a seven times or eight times higher redislocation rate in the arthroscopic bank heart, and they concluded that they do not recommend the arthroscopic bank heart procedure for patients who have recurrent dislocation. Uh, but again, I think we have to look at these a little more critically to better define our, our sort of indications. So for clearly the latter J is great, but there are issues. It's non-anatomic. You're basically taking the coracoid, bringing it to the anterior aspect of the glenoid. And I'm, I'm as optimistic as anyone. But the problem is, you know, I always want to think about, you know, particularly because you're doing these in young patients and, and the results are not perfect. You know, what's your bailout? What's your next procedure if this goes wrong? And there aren't great bailouts here. This is really, you know, you can do an eating hymenet. You can use allografts to sort of reconstruct the anterior aspect of the glenoid if the latter J fails. But these are not great options. So, you know, if you don't have to start with, with the, you know, kind of end of the road, I think it's better. There are a lot of short, there's a high incidence of short-term complications. Now, Jill Walsh does, as I mentioned, you know, more of these than anybody, and he's become technically outstanding. Uh, but this is a study from J.P. Warner, also a very good shoulder surgeon, doesn't do the procedure as frequently. They looked at their first, you know, 40 or 50 of these and found an almost 25% incidence of short-term complications. Um, it, ranging from infection to non-union. Now, a lot of the infections were superficial, didn't require more treatment, but it's still, you know, it's, it's an issue for the patients um, that's more significant when you're doing an open procedure than when you're doing an arthroscopic bank heart through a few poke holes. Recurrent instability did occur. Nerve injury is a concern, particularly, you know, when there's more bone loss. Uh, and non-union is an issue. These don't always heal. That was the short term. There's also long-term complications. Painful hardware uh, from the screws, screw breakage, osteoarthritis. Uh, you know, if if you're not doing a lot of these and you don't put that coracoid at the perfect position, uh, even a little bit sort of too lateral, and you're going to really subject the patient to a quick development of arthritis in the shoulder. So, it, it's not a benign procedure. So you could say, okay, well, arthroscop. You know, if arthroscopy is, is good, we, you know, you could do the ladder J arthroscopically, and maybe that'll sort of obviate some of the complications we're seeing with the open procedure, such as infection. But even the arthroscopic ladder J, which is much more technically demanding, but it also has its own set of complications. It makes it much more difficult to put the graft at the appropriate position. And if you're not putting the graft at the appropriate position, that's going to lead to its own whole subset of problems, including increased tensioning on the graft, which may cause higher rates of non-union, um, decreased range of motion postoperatively, uh, and just more difficult surgically. This was a study by a group in uh, Cincinnati, Paul Favorito uh, and, and George Athwell from Canada, who looked at the North American experience of short-term complications with the arthroscopic ladder J procedure. So they looked at their first 80 patients. Almost 20% of them had a problem, um, which, again, whether it was just sort of persistent pain, 
Nothing that you would consider a, you know, a frank complication per se, but 18% of patients had some issue that may have led them to be a little less happy. Uh, and a, a, a you know, distinct complication in 10% of the cases with an intraoperative coracoid fracture being the most common. So just saying, okay, we'll do a ladder J arthroscopically to get sort of the benefits of, of an arthroscopic bank heart is not a, it's not a chip shot either. And that has its own issues. So again, ladder J works great in, in the best hands, but even in the hands of very good surgeons, there's a high complication rate ranging from 10 to 25%. So it's a trade-off. You've got a very stable shoulder the majority of the time with a ladder J, but there's a lot of complications. So for me, that's why I don't use it every time. And I, I take a little bit of a different approach. I mentioned that, you know, just looking at glenoid bone loss is a, you know, it, is not very realistic. You know, we've really got, we've, we've transitioned our thinking from just glenoid bone loss to bipolar bone loss. So looking at both the glenoid and the humeral head and how these interact and how they interact is reduced to, is this an on track or off track lesion? So with the bone loss, when you, you know, when you move the humerus through a range of motion, is it staying in contact with the glenoid or is it sort of falling off the front edge? Is it, is it, it the term we used to use was, is it engaging? Uh, but now we call that an off track lesion. Is it falling off the track? I mentioned the Hill Sachs lesion. It's associated with anywhere from 40 to 90% of, of instability cases. Uh, and when it's a recurrent instability case, it's almost there, you know, 100% of the time. This is a study by, uh, by the Japanese group looking at, and they really kind of originally designed, or, or I'm sorry, described that glenoid track concept. And it, the math is complicated for me, but they define the medial margin of the glenoid track at 84% of the glenoid width from the rotator cuff footprint. So this is the glenoid track right here, um, that, that area, which is 84% of the glenoid width measured typically on a CT scan. And they've, this is obviously a drawing, and I'll show some pictures in a second, but the drawing here it basically sits within that glenoid track, so that's going to be an on-track lesion. It's not going to be an issue. The problem is when the, when the lesion extends outside of the, the width of the glenoid, and now you've got an off-track lesion. So with decreasing glenoid bone, as depicted here in this, this lesion, there's a more, it's much more likely that that hill Sachs lesion is going to be off-track or it's going to be outside the glenoid track. And that's when it becomes a problem for patients. Uh, and that's when you know, doing something solely arthroscopically is probably a problem. One thing that's critical is it really doesn't depend on, on the width of the lesion. So this would be, on the left here, this would be a very wide, shallow hill Sachs lesion. But that's tolerated pretty well. The problematic ones are the medial lesions, where you start to get more medial, uh, and it just that's really going to significantly increase the likelihood that the lesion engages or is off track. Has this been borne out clinically? Well, this is uh, the group from the uh, U.S. military, J.T. Tokish and Greg Batani, looked at bank heart repairs for anterior instability. So this is an arthroscopic bank heart repair for instability. And as I showed earlier, you know, not, not perfect results. They had an 18% recurrence at two-year follow-up. When they looked at the on-track lesions, though, there were only four failures. And this contrasted with a 75% failure rate in the off-track patients. In the, in the non-recurrence group, 17% of them actually had bone loss greater than 20%. So to look at just bone loss, you know, that's a group we would have said needs a ladder J procedure. Um, but it really involves that on track. I think that on track, off track discussion or description gives us a much more you know, sophisticated way to look at this. And they found that the positive predictive value of an off track measurement was 75%. And this contrasted with just looking at glenoid bone loss that had a positive predictive value of failure of only 43%. So again, making the point that looking at isolated glenoid bone loss is probably a, you know, a bit you know, of a fallacy. Another study um, by a group in Europe looked at a retrospective review of 100 patients treated with an arthroscopic bank heart. 88% of these were an on-track lesion. And if it was, if it was an on-track lesion, only a 6% failure rate. So again, getting much more in line with what we see for, the, for open ladder J if you get more sort of sophisticated as to how we're going to indicate somebody for surgery. So what can we do you know, to kind of address this? Well, one discussion is, uh, is remplissage. And uh, that base, uh, I'm going to talk about that in more detail. But this is kind of, you know, 
that the uh, a sort of an algorithm as to how to treat these. You know, looking at on track off track lesions, and I'm going to go through this in more detail. But basically, if you've got an on track lesion, there's kind of four different groups here. An on track lesion with a, with a less than 25 percent glenoid bone loss, they recommend an arthroscopic bank cart repair. Less than 20, 25% bone loss on the glenoid with an off-track lesion, you're going to have to do an arthroscopic bank cart plus. And I'll discuss different pluses or, or things that I use to address that. Now, most would agree when you get to more than 25% bone loss, whether it's on track or off track, that's going to be a ladder J and maybe even a ladder J with something else, which, which is beyond the scope of this talk. But, but that, a ladder J is going to work well. And, and whether it's here, Europe, America, Asia, they're going to you know, most will agree that that gets a ladder J. So I think the old algorithm, you know, for me was this arthroscopic bank heart when you got up to about 20% of bone loss, at which point I'd switch to a ladder J. And that probably accounted for a lot of the failures that we were seeing arthroscopically. We've gotten a little more sophisticated, and now we've got this sort of yellow group, that, that group that's higher risk, that's going to need a little more, whether it's an arthroscopic bank heart plus a remplissage, plus grafting that hill Sachs lesion, maybe a double row repair. We've got several different options that would fall into this yellow category, um, but that's where we've gotten more sophisticated, and I think that's where we've really improved the results of our arthroscopic surgery and not necessarily needed to subject a patient to a ladder J procedure. For me, the, you know, the, res- the indications for a bank heart plus remplissage would be good capsule labor. You still need good quality tissue. If they don't have that, you know, doing a repair is not going to help them. Glenoid bone loss, less than about 13.5%, um, and then a hill Sachs lesion that engages after you do your arthroscopic bank heart. A remplissage um, is basically a tenodesis of the infraspinatus into that hill Sachs defect, and it basically converts an off-track lesion to an on-track lesion. So top left, you can see this, this is the humeral head. This is viewing from a, you know, the patients in the lateral decubitus position, so they're kind of lying down like this. Um, so the bottom here is the, is the glenoid. Here's the humeral head with that hill Sachs lesion. You can see normal articular cartilage is white, and then you start getting into that hill Sachs lesion. And when you externally rotate the arm here, you see it's falling off the front of the glenoid. That would be an off-track lesion. So one way to address this is by tenodesing the infraspinatus into that hill Sachs lesion. So we put anchors into the hill Sachs lesion, which you see here going through the, uh, through the infraspinatus, and then tie down, and now you've reduced the infraspinatus into that hill Sachs lesion down there. So that's a remplissage. Here's, a, here's another representative example of the, you know, doing the bank heart anteriorly, and then that's the, the remplissage posteriorly. And here's a video of this. this is, so this is, again, looking from a lateral decubitus position, viewing from a posterior portal. So I'm looking to the front of the shoulder, and that's a probe. I've got the inferior glenohumeral ligament you know, peeled off the anterior labrum there, um, the anterior glenoid. And there's the hill Sachs lesion. So that little dent there is the hill Sachs. So the first thing I do um, is I'm going to place my anchors posteriorly here. So I'm going percutaneously through the infraspinatus, and I'm going to bring that infraspinatus tendon into that defect to, again, convert a off-track lesion into an on-track lesion. So here are anchors being inserted And now I've got anchors, and I, I'll use two here. And then I go to the front of the shoulder, and I pass sutures, just like you saw earlier uh, in this talk, to repair the bank heart lesion anteriorly. So I've now repaired the bank heart lesion anteriorly. I'm now viewing from an anterior portal to look posteriorly. I've passed the sutures through my infraspinatus, and now I'm going to tie these down to, again, tina de- the tendon into that defect. And that's the, the completed project. One issue with remplissage, again, none of these things are perfect, which is why we've got different options. Uh, Laterman found that there was poor accuracy of suture passage during remplissage. So uh, Pascal Boileau did a study. He found that patients who had remplissage had some postoperative external rotation loss and posterior shoulder pain in a percent of patients. So one of the things we looked at in the lab was can we improve the accuracy of our suture passage? Because one of the things that we hypothesized was that when you're passing these sutures, a lot of times you're actually not going through the infraspinatus tendon, which is how it was described, but instead through the muscle tendon junction or even through the muscle, that's going to limit external rotation, and it's also going to cause pain posteriorly. So 
we looked at um, identifying different surface landmarks to improve the placement of posterior sutures and then validated this uh, in a cadaver study. And we found that we, we basically defined a safe zone that was one centimeter lateral and three centimeters distal to the posterior lateral aspect to the acromion. And if you pass the sutures through this area, through this safe zone, none of the sutures went medial to the muscle tendon junction. So you weren't going through the muscle. Uh, and this contrasted with almost 20% in the control group that passed through that area. So I think by being a little more scientific about how we pass our sutures through the infraspinatus tendon uh, is going to allow the results of remplissage to be a little better. So how does doing an uh, isolated arthroscopic bank heart compared to doing a bank heart with remplissage for anterior instability with an engaging hill sax. This was a meta-analysis by a group in France, uh, and they had a high, an isolated arthroscopic bank heart, had significantly higher recurrence risk and lower functional outcomes. They couldn't con uh, comment on range of motion, though. Another group looked at 189 patients with off-track lesions and less than 25% bone loss. So that goes to, and actually they did, this was that group that I told, that kind of group two in that algorithm earlier, where it was you know less than 25% bone loss off track, um, which some would consider doing a ladder J for. And they looked at ladder J versus an arthroscopic bank heart plus remplissage. And again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Each issue, each group has their own trade-offs. They found increasing pain and decreased internal rotation and abduction in the remplissage group. But as I mentioned earlier, the ladder J group had an increased complication rate. One thing they did find that was that while outcome measures uh, were equal and no difference in revision rate or recurrent instability, the latter J group, when you started to get to you know kind of 10 or 12 percent bone loss, was better in contact and collision athletes. And I think this is an important point, and I'll, I'll make it again at the end. But you know we've talked about bone loss, we've talked about you know complications. A huge factor, particularly in a hospital like this and, and where I work, is what are, you, what are these athletes going back to? What sports are they playing? Because that's really going to factor into how you decide to treat them. Are there other ways to convert an off-track to an on-track? Well, kind of what's old is new again. You know, 10, 10 15 years ago, uh, a group in, in Korea looked at trying to reduce that hill sax lesion. So if you could tamp it up, um, you know, then you could basically – decrease the, you know, the contribution of the, of the humeral side to that off-track concept and, and maybe then just get away with doing an arthroscopic bank heart. We looked at this in the lab, uh, comparing anterior stabilization with a remplissage to an anterior stabilization where we reduced the hill sax lesion. So we tamped it up, and we found that both um, worked well stability-wise, but there was slightly decreased external rotation in the remplissage group. So this might be a good option. Um, in acute cases, because if it's a chronic case, it's really very difficult to tamp up that hill sax lesion. But in an acute case, in somebody who needs maximum external rotation, like a baseball player that I treat, this might be a better option than, than doing a remplissage or a ladder J. How do we do it? Well, you can use an ACL guide and percutaneously um, you know, drill over it. Uh, and then uh, you, you basically localize the lesion percutaneously with arthroscopy or even with x-ray. Um, you'll tamp up the lesion, and then actually, um, a, you know, you can then backfill it with any bone void filler uh, cement to prevent it from uh, collapsing again, almost like a kyphoplasty in the spine. How about doing a double row repair? Well, we talk about double row rotator cuff repairs all the time because it's better for healing and they're stronger. Well, why don't we, you know, use that for the labrum? You can. And, you know, if you have a large ALPS lesion, so this is a view looking from the anterior superior portal down the neck of the glenoid. So here's the humeral head. Here's the neck of the glenoid. Here's the entire capsule and labral complex that's been peeled off. So this whole area is bone, and that's what you want, you know, things to heal back to. You've got this big surface area. That's where we want that glenoid, the labrum and capsule to heal back to. Laurent Lafosse from, uh, from uh, Annecy, France, described doing a double row repair. And it, it makes sense, you know, sort of anatomically, because if you look at the at how the labrum and, and glenohumeral ligament attaches, at around if you again use kind of the face of a clock analogy here. So if this would be two o'clock and this would be six o'clock, as you get to kind of four, five, and six o'clock where you have your typical bank heart lesions where the labrum tears off, the the labrum doesn't just sort of attach at the glenoid, you know, just at a point fixation. It's it goes over a depth of almost a centimeter, as I just showed on this on this picture, you know, so 
you've got that whole area of healing, which if you just do a single row repair to the top of the, the neck of the glenoid there, you're not reproducing the normal anatomy. Uh, we looked at that, and that's, you know, again, this is a study by a group of Korea, and they show the contact pressures. You clearly reestablish more contact pressure by doing a double row repair. And we looked at it in the lab biomechanically, and it's, you know, again, a little intuitive, but a double row repair was much stronger in terms of ultimate yield and ultimate load to failure. So it's stronger, it better recreates the anatomy. So for me, there's an indication for this as well. Again, if you've got these alps lesions where it's completely peeled off in a, maybe a higher demand athlete, a wrestler, or a, somebody in motocross or football, um, I started to do it open where this is a view of the uh, neck of the glenoid here. Here's your glenoid. And again, that whole area is exposed. So you put suture anchors medially on the neck of the glenoid grab your, your kind of capsule of labral tissue, bring it up, and then fix it laterally just to the, you know, to the, just to the, off the glenoid where you would typically put your single anchor, and now you've reestablished kind of a nice double row repair, better establish the anatomy. After doing it open, transition to doing it arthroscopically, and here's a similar case where you've got that whole, co you know, that whole capsule of labral complex peeled off with a lot of exposed glenoid footprint there. I apologize that I didn't have a video for this, but... Um, Again, placing an anchor medially, passing the sutures through the torn labrum, and then bringing them up to an anotless anchor laterally just off the glenoid. So it can be done arthroscopically. Um, that's, and you know, for me, I'll do that, again, if there's a big Alps lesion, good quality tissue in somebody who's a bit higher demand, you know, such as a motocross or, or a wrestler. So... Ladder, to conclude, you know, the, the ladder J works well, but it's not without complications and it's difficult to revise and not everyone needs it. For me, it really depends on the amount of bone loss on both the humerus and the glenoid, as well as the tissue quality and sports participation. I, uh, and it, when I talk to patients, because, you know, patients have heard of this and, and friends have had it and they say, why aren't you doing it everybody? And I think sometimes it can be overkill. So you can, you know, you can drive your kids to school in the tank, um, and it would get them there safely. Probably not the most practical way to get there. Or you could do it in an SUV, which, you know, again, has its role. And, and, you know, to take a kid to school, that's probably the most effective way to do it. If you're treating baseball players like I do, the complications of a ladder J, you know, probably aren't worth it um, if they don't need it. Again, if somebody doesn't have a lot of bone loss, where maximum range of motion is critical, an arthroscopic stabilization is going to do very well. Now, to be fair, at the other end of the spectrum, contact athletes, American football, rugby players, even with no bone loss, there's enough studies to show that arthroscopic stabilization is probably going to fail, you know, 15, 20 percent of the time. And that's too high a failure rate for me to want to deal with in the office. And I'm going to go. So I will take the increased complication risk profile with a ladder J and do a ladder J in that group. And then you've got footballers here or you know, soccer players in America. You could probably do either. You know, if not a lot of bone loss, they're not overhead athletes. It's a little bit of contact, not as much as they sometimes lead you to believe. Uh, so you could probably do an arthroscopic bank card, and I have, and they do very well. Uh, and you could do a ladder J because, or a remplissage because the, the, probably the decreased range of motion that may occur is not going to affect them with what they do in their sport. So to summarize, I think, like anything else in, in orthopedics and sports medicine, it's really a discussion with your patient. There's not one thing that works perfectly. It's really a discussion based on their expectations, what they do, what they want to get back to, and what pathology you're presented with. Thank you.